questions for reflection. The churches throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria were now left in peace, building themselves up and living in the fear of the Lord. Encouraged by the Holy Spirit, they continued to grow. These words began our first reading for today's Holy Mass. Once again, these readings from the Acts of the Apostles reflect the early church after the descent of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. Notice Peter is being used by the Holy Spirit to continue the presence of miracles, the signs of the kingdom, which occurred in the public ministry of Jesus. This is what the Lord promised. In this reading, we see the healing of a paralytic and the raising from the dead of a young woman named Tabitha, or Dorcas in Greek. Every year, the celebration of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost is an invitation to each one of us to have the very same encounter. It is the Holy Spirit which makes it possible for us to live lives of sacrificial love, of holiness and service, in a world that God still loves, a world into which He still sends His Son through the body of Christ, the Church, of which we are members. As we move forward in this Easter season and toward Pentecost, let us ask for a fresh outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the whole Church. We are, in this millennium, commissioned to carry forward the very same mission of those first disciples who gathered with Mary, the mother of the Lord. Jesus promised his followers, Amen, Amen, I say to you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I do and will do greater ones than these because I am going to the Father. That's John 14, 12. That includes you and me. Ask for the Lord to pour out his Holy Spirit on you, on your family, indeed, on the whole church. The psalmist pledges, I shall fulfill my vows to the Lord. What are the vows, the promises, we have made to the Lord? It begins with our baptismal promises. It includes the recitation of the creed. For those who are married in Christ, it includes the marriage vows we made to our spouse to love them in a way that manifests Christ's love for his bride, the church. For those who are living a life of consecrated Christian celibacy, it means forsaking one spouse to be free to love the whole church and become a sign of the life to come where there will be no marriage, because we're all married to the Lord and joined to Him in an eternal communion. Are we fulfilling all those vows, those promises? If not, we need to repent and ask the Lord for the grace to do so. In our Gospel text appointed for today, Jesus has just finished his extensive, beautiful, but deeply challenging discourse explaining that he is the bread of life. In that teaching he told them, and he tells us, he who eats my body and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not such as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. This he said in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. And that's from John 6. Many of his disciples left him. Would we have been numbered among them? In their statement on the real presence of Jesus in the sacrament of the Eucharist, the bishops of the United States wrote, and I quote, recalling these words of Jesus, the Catholic Church professes that in the celebration of the Eucharist, Bread and wine become the body and blood of Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit and the instrumentality of the priest. The whole Christ is truly present, body, blood, soul, and divinity, under the appearances of bread and wine. The glorified Christ who rose from the dead after dying for our sins. This is what the church means when she speaks of the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. This presence of Christ in the Eucharist is called real, not to exclude other types of His presence, as if they could not be understood as real. The risen Christ is present to His Church in many ways, but most especially through the sacrament of His body and blood." End quote. Now listen to the clear teaching of the Catholic Catechism, citing the teaching of the early fathers of the Church, and I quote, the mode of Christ's presence under the Eucharistic species is unique. It raises the Eucharist above all the sacraments as the perfection of the spiritual life and the end to which all the sacraments tend. 
In the most blessed sacrament of the Eucharist, the body and blood together with the soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ, and therefore the whole Christ, is truly, really, and substantially contained. This presence is called real, by which it is not intended to exclude the other types of presence. They're real too. That was cited by the bishops, and that is the teaching of the Catholic Church. The Catechism continues. It is by the conversion of the bread and wine into Christ's body and blood that Christ becomes present in this sacrament. The Church Fathers strongly affirmed the faith of the Church in the efficacy of the Word of Christ and of the action of the Holy Spirit to bring about this conversion. Thus St. John Chrysostom declares, and this is a quote, it is not man that causes the things offered to become the body and blood of Christ, but he who was crucified for us, Christ himself. The priest in the role of Christ pronounces these words, but their power and grace are God's. This is my body, he says. This word transforms the things offered." End quote. And St. Ambrose says this about this conversion, and I quote, "'Be convinced that this is not what nature has formed, but what the blessing has consecrated. The power of the blessing prevails over that of nature, because by the blessing nature itself is changed. Could not Christ's word, which can make from nothing what did not exist, change existing things into what they were not before? It is no less a feat to give things their original nature than to change their nature. And that's from the Catechism, paragraphs 1374 and 1375. Now, do we really believe in the real presence of Jesus in the sacrament of the Eucharist? Or have we figuratively joined those who left Jesus, as we heard in this gospel text? 